the New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, American corporations find a new strategy to dominate the international electronic marketplace. Also, Stuart Brand, the man who brought us the Whole Earth Catalog, is now putting together a guide to new tech products. Later, a commentary from author Isaac Asimov and a look at cordless telephones, all in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Warsaw Insurance Companies. Times change. Warsaw works. I'm Nicholas Johnson. It's hard for us to think of any kind of technology these days without thinking of the Japanese. Automobiles, cameras, especially consumer electronics. How have they done it? What does it mean to each of us? As patriotic Americans, we like to see our nation number one. But as consumers, we're looking for a bargain. And Japanese electronics often turn out to be more innovative, higher quality, and cheaper than our own. 20 years ago, I traveled to Japan fairly regularly as maritime administrator and later as FCC commissioner. Like most Americans, I developed a tremendous respect and affection for the Japanese people, their language and culture and religion, their dedication to education and hard work. We talked then of the coming revolution in communications, and what's happened since has more than borne out our early predictions. To know how Japanese electronics will continue to affect you we need to start with an update on what's going on. Ken Munt has this report. From compact cars to hand calculators, the Japanese always seem to be able to take our technology and produce products more efficiently and cheaply. The latest battle lines have been drawn in the microelectronics field. Pamela McCordick, who recently co-authored the fifth generation, a book chronicling the Japanese plan for preeminence, sees this latest skirmish as critical. I think there's a real fear that moving ahead with the next generation of computers and leaving the rest of the world behind means that whoever has that advantage has a permanent advantage. And we've seen it in things like um, video recorders. The Japanese had a small advantage in video recorders, a technology, by the way, that was invented in the United States. And they just leveraged that into an enormous advantage, so it didn't even pay for American companies to get back into the game. Well, that could be catastrophic if it happens in computing. But if you're not a shareholder in a large computer firm, why is this battle important? After all, isn't this just a big business problem? It's a fair question to ask, why does it matter to the ordinary person? And the answer to that question is that computing is the technology that drives all other technologies. So if you have exceptionally good computer-aided design, then the products you manufacture are going to be better. If you have exceptionally good computer-aided decision-making systems, then you're going to make faster, smarter decisions all the way across the spectrum. If you have the powerful computers, you will be the more powerful. One way the United States plans to keep this power is to form research and development pools for large corporations. One of the biggest of these R&D consortiums is Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation. Michael Cooper is one of their attorneys. Well, MCC is basically an umbrella research organization with uh, 13 companies. And the 13 companies uh, participate to varying degrees right now in four research projects uh, in the computer and microelectronics area. And the participation in the projects varies among the companies. They select projects to participate in. The companies will donate researchers and money to MCC in exchange for the rights to use the results. Those results could mean big profits for the corporations. A supercomputer can sell for up to $100,000 but they could also mean a bonanza for consumers. Just like hand calculators and digital watches, increases in technology will mean decreases in personal computer prices.
But like every panacea, there may be a flaw in the R&D pooling plan, the specter of antitrust. The antitrust status of MCC is not at all clear. And that may be one of the places where we shoot ourselves in the foot as Americans, because we're so busy worrying about antitrust that we will commit what amounts to a suicide pact with ourselves and our industry, because we don't concentrate resources. Not everyone is quite so certain that R&D pools are the way to avoid suicide. Joseph M. Aliotto is a San Francisco-based antitrust lawyer who's worried about the precedent set by MCC. It eliminates competition uh, between these companies and substitutes instead a combination and a technological cartel, which in my judgment um, will not produce the best possible products at the lowest possible prices for the people, and that it has a tendency for much more dangerous aspects when these large companies are permitted to get together. Eliotto believes that these giant consortiums, or cartels as he calls them, will stifle the innovation and creativity of small, struggling entrepreneurs. It is because of the individuals, not the combines or the cartels, but the individuals that bring the new products. Something like nine out of ten new products are innovated by smaller new companies, in addition to eight out of ten new jobs. One of the smallest companies, I think, that, that developed technology in semiconductor industry was a, a little company called AT&T that developed the transistor. Uh, a lot of industries uh, reach a mature stage where it takes a lot of resources to make that next big leap. Uh, the bright ideas are, are, are still necessary, but the bright ideas in order to come to fruition require a lot of money, a lot of other talent, uh, and a commitment. If the combines are permitted, or the cartels are permitted, if they're permitted to put smaller companies out of business in effect, if they are permitted to have the control over this new development and a new economic era, uh, we're going to see fewer innovators, fewer entrepreneurs, and fewer jobs. But in this computer age, are the antitrust laws outdated? Should we have new laws for these new tech times? I think antitrust does have a place, but circumstances have changed since the turn of the 20th century. Circumstances have changed enormously, and we are still operating under laws that were formulated for the trusts of the late 1890s. A hundred years has practically gone by. We've got to bring our laws up to date, and we are a nation of laws. It has to be done by legal means. Right now, Congress is considering legislation that would exempt research and development pools like MCC from antitrust suits. If passed, it remains to be seen, of course, if that legislation would actually help or hurt U.S. innovation in microelectronics. What is known is that the latest battle is probably the most important yet. The Japanese have announced very ambitious goals, and the question of whether they will indeed meet those goals is up in the air. We don't know. But if they do meet them, we will be left in the dust. Who will be left in the dust? Sure, we need exports and we need full employment. But are you really hurt by having a choice of consumer electronics and other products from around the world? U.S. computer firms like Osborne are going bankrupt not because of Japanese computers, but because IBM and ATT are rapidly taking over the home computer market. If the antitrust laws are no longer needed because they're 100 years old, well, I guess that makes the U.S. Constitution twice as useless. After all, it's 200 years old. Well, enough of all this. What do ordinary people like you and I think about these developments? We went to a shopping mall to find out. Things are more convenient. I can go to my bank at midnight and take money out now. Uh, it's easier to make telephone calls. Uh, the whole communications field has just blossomed in a way that I think will be very beneficial. Well, I uh, like it. I think it's the greatest thing that ever happened. It's affected our life in many ways. First, my wife has all the appliances, like the radar ranges and all that. Then our sons both have uh, home computers that they use. And I'm in a business of manufacturing signs, and we use a computer operate electronic uh, keyboard uh, to operate our signs. They're, you may, they make you smarter, and they, they have your... Yeah, um, learn more stuff about other things. I'm not for it too much because I heard recently about a man who got a gun and shot his lawnmower. 
and I felt like I should do that with a few computers. I think it's difficult for people. I think most people don't understand the technology and um, they need to be shown how to use it usefully, not how to play with it, how to use it in their lives to their advantage, not to just use the technology to make more time to waste to do other things that are less useful. If you can use it usefully to make your life more fruitful, then I think it's good. At one time, people were leery of electric lights. They thought gas lights were safer. And I think that's the problem today, is they don't understand the new technology. And if they went through the trouble to try to understand it, they wouldn't be coping with it. They'd have it working for them. In the final analysis, it really does come down to you and me. What we think about this new technology and how we can use it in our lives, or whether we want to opt out entirely, whether it will be used by us to serve us or by others to oppress us. You remember the 60s? Alternative lifestyles, power to the people, appropriate technology. I began that decade in Berkeley, California. And one of our heroes then was a gentleman across the bay in Sausalito named Stuart Brand, who later gave us the Whole Earth Catalog. Well, Stuart is still in Sausalito and still putting out catalogs for the people. But these days, they're about computers. Barry Stoner produced our report. There's so much stuff available. And that's, I think, what's feeling, making people who are shopping feel burdened. There's too much to shop among. So the book should be small and pretty straightforward and uh, fiercely honest about what we think is good and enough about why we think it's good so they can question our judgment and, and go off at a tangent to it. This is Stuart Brand. He's in the catalog business here in Sausalito, California, across the bay from San Francisco. In the salt converted warehouse, he collected information for his first mail order wish book back in 1968, the Whole Earth Catalog. It was a comprehensive guide to everything you needed to outfit a counterculture, complete with Brand's own philosophical musings. The catalog was critically acclaimed and sold over 250 million copies. But times change. The age of Aquarius was replaced by the age of computers. Of all of the groups now dealing with personal computers, I think the old Whole Earth Catalog bunch has the least immunity to them and are you know, designing them, <laughs> writing the software, selling the stuff, writing books about it, uh, waxing fat on this whole process. And Stuart Brand is joining their ranks. He was recently advanced $1.3 million to produce a quarterly magazine that will form the basis for the Holder Software Catalog. The scope, all personal computer stuff, and hopefully some personal computer wisdom, but that's gravy and we'll see. The first step was to rent a place to put the book together, hire editor Richard Dalton, who has the technical expertise, and start collecting software products to review. This is just the beginnings of what we'll eventually have because we expect to have thousands of programs overall. This is the beginnings of our research department. Uh, we have three people now who are acquiring software so that we can use it for uh, evaluation of a particular program. In this room, we have the beginnings of what will be kind of a software laboratory so that we can test out programs, make sure they work, and show all the features of various types of uh, software. One of the problems we've run across is that for all the computerization, no one's been able to figure out how to get rid of the boxes. Uh, eventually, we'll be shipping some of these back, and in fact, there's going to be a lot more boxes before we're through. Gathering the products to review is one problem, but gathering information about which products are good enough to buy is a bigger one. There's a lot of gossip. It's how people mainly shop for stuff, you know, software, hardware, and the whole gamut. Users at this point really are the experts. The industry is trying to find out what people need. Uh, users already know that. We're really reaching out mostly through the phone lines. Matthew is part of our research department, and one of his jobs is to check in with the networks that we use to communicate with uh, literally thousands of people all over the US. What we really want from them is two to six paragraphs that tells us why they love a particular program. And there are some real gems of wisdom in there. This electronic network of contributing reviewers is a unique approach. 
and Stuart Brand needs the help to deal with the uncharted ocean of software information. Of the people we have working on the software catalog, I think I know least about software specifically. But hopefully as an editor in that sense, I can maintain the user or the buyer's point of view, which is a similar ignorance. You know, okay, I give up, I think I need this tool, what do I do now? As products and reviews are collected, the scope of the magazine becomes more defined. We have two publications, and the software review, which is a quarterly publication, will serve as a build-up to the Whole Earth Catalog. Well, we're not talking about how to use computers. We're talking about uh, somewhat how to buy, and more especially what to buy. And it will not be comprehensive. It won't cover the 40,000 or so programs that are out there. We're not going to provide a list of programs. We're going to provide evaluation of what's best. It's a 200-page book, a you whole know, software catalog, not as large as in page size even as the old Whole Earth catalog. We are non-commercial. We don't accept advertising. Because of that, uh, the ad department is not determining editorial content. In fact, the only thing that uh, sells the magazine is our editorial content. And that editorial content is guided by Stuart Brand. He has a great understanding of what computers can do and how they affect people. He's not a technician, but he, he's quicker at evaluating the program and finding a bad one than anyone I've ever seen. Well, the more you deal with this stuff, the more impatient you get. So if you've dealt with a fast program, then the slow programs torture you. If you've dealt with a fast machine, uh, then a slow machine like uh, the Epson with Valdox just seems glacially, punishingly slow. He's part artist, part uh, writer, part actor, part uh, seer. And um, it's been a rewarding experience so far. We haven't always agreed. My first review of Word Vision, uh, Richard Dalton, the editor, just cut to pieces. And I was uh, in a sour mood for half a day because of that. But what had happened is I had either used technical terms so much, you know, showing off that I knew them and didn't explain them, or made up my own, like, agility uh, as being a good thing about the program and didn't explain what I meant by agility, and it became a problem. And when problems get frustrating, Brand and his staff take a midday break from the catalog. I know that we will start by making a extremely commercial product and then hope that our basic soulfulness and honesty and whatever uh, that we bring from 15 years of board catalog will continue to be in that. There's a lot of people who could come along and absolutely knock us off, and then we'd have to review them, that would be nice. And after a day of reviewing electronic products, Stuart Brand goes to his houseboat. And this former guru of the counterculture makes his home in the New Tech Times. The Whole Earth Software Catalog will be available in 1984. That visit with Stuart Brand reminds me, you know, one of the most exciting things to me about the computer age is the possibility that it will actually humanize us rather than the opposite. Because to discover the powers of computers, one must also stumble upon their weaknesses, the ways in which we always have been and likely always will be superior to these machines. And that inspiring and reassuring discovery leads us at least it leads me, to take a greater interest in the powers and potential of the human brain. It's a subject that has interested one of America's most famous science fiction writers and futurists as well. Here's this week's guest commentator, Isaac Asimov. In my opinion, it is not that computerized machines are going to be extensions of human beings, or that humans will be extensions of computerized machines. They are going to be moving along parallel paths. The machines doing that for which they are best equipped and we doing that for which we are. The machines can handle arithmetical operations extremely quickly and without error. We, on the other hand, we human beings, can demonstrate insight, intuition, creativity, fantasy, 
imagination. And as long as they do what they are best equipped to do and we do what we are, we will together form a symbiotic pair who will be able to move along further and faster than either one of us could do alone. This is, to my way of thinking, the real significance of the forthcoming artificial intelligence. A second intelligence equivalent to ours, but not equal. And we will be not extensions of each other, we will be friends and allies. For the first time in history, humanity will have a friend and ally, and it will be so much the better for us. If you have story ideas or comments, send them to the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Home electronics expert Danny Goodman has joined us again this week. And our topic for review this time is the cordless telephone. Hi, Danny, and welcome to New Tech Times again. Hello, Nick. Tell us about these cordless phones. I thought by definition a phone had a cord. These are uh, often used as extension telephones around the home and something that you can literally go out in your backyard to your neighbor's, uh, neighbor's home, down the street even, and uh, still stay in touch. Well, now, why would somebody want one of those? Primarily for convenience. If someone finds themselves out in the garden or at the poolside or down the street or at the neighbor's, uh, it's, it's quite possible that you want to be able to answer the phone or make a call. How far can they go? Uh, the ranges can be up to about 700 feet uh, under normal conditions. That but, will vary. Uh, is this a big item or uh, trivial? Uh, how much money are we talking about uh, if somebody wants to get one of these new toys? They can, you can put a lot of money into it. You can spend anywhere from $100 for an answer-only phone to three, $400 for some pretty fancy gimmicks. Are there any problems, anything the customers, the consumers got to look out for uh, on this one? Indeed, there are. I thought there might be. <laughs> Probably the, the most important to understand is that because it's a radio, anyone with a shortwave receiver or a scanner can listen in on your phone conversation. It is anything but secure. Secondly, there are interference problems between cordless phone systems. If your neighbor has one, it could be a problem with uh, interfering. Could the somebody phone. else be making calls on, on your phone? If they're on the same channel, yes. They can, you, someone could call Tahiti on your telephone without you wow. knowing it. So start running up a phone bill for you. Yeah. Now, I remember at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, a group of industry folks got together talking about this, and their attitude seemed to be, let's get this equipment out there with the customer consumers as quickly as we can uh, so we don't have to deal with these problems. Seems to me like we've got a major consumer uh, issue on our hands here. <laughs> no, it's not quite that bad. They, uh, there are some companies that are doing some very substantial development in technology. For example, PhoneMate has uh, eliminated a lot of the return problems of cordless telephones by letting the consumer adjust the telephone to eliminate as much of the interference as possible without having to take the phone back to the dealer. I see. So there are some solutions then. And so that yeah. brings us to your final recommendation. And what do you think is the bottom line? Should we all go get one? If you have a need for one, I think they're very convenient. But you have to be aware of the interference problems. Get a late, late model that has uh, a lot of the interference solu solutions built into them. Good advice, Danny Goodman. Thank you. As always, we're interested in hearing what products you'd like to see reviewed, so send me your ideas. In this week's game review, we learn why it's not nice to encourage kids to blow up American banks, but acceptable to have them play at blowing up foreign banks. Sound interesting? Here's video game developer Patrick Ranzell. When you're designing a game, you really need to create an entire fantasy environment that the game player can become absorbed in. A popular fantasy has always been being a secret agent. Okay, you know, there are James Bond films and Man from Uncle, things like that. And what you're supposed to do is drive around through the city and you're avoiding secret police, you're avoiding civilian cars and driving around and you're supposed to find the foreign embassy and you have to pick the safe there. You have a certain amount of time to do it. The game originally started out to be a cops and robbers thing. The objective of the game was to rob banks and last as long as you could. And then we took it to the Consumer Electronics Show. We got enough negative feedback and you know we thought about it and we said, this really doesn't make sense to put out. This is not the image that we want to project as a company. 
and we just didn't want kids going around having fun robbing banks and having this game reinforce it. So what we said is, well, how can we change the objective and the theme of this game to be something which is not teaching bad habits? It was a situation where either you were a good guy and you were robbing things from the bad guys, okay, in which case they couldn't be the, the local government, or the local government had to be the bad guys and you were a good guy and getting things so that naturally lent itself to a secret agent in a foreign country where you assume that the foreign country is the bad guys that you're trying to you know get something out of i'm glad that game's over walter cronkite used to warn us that no one could become adequately informed by watching network television news he said we had to read books and magazines and newspapers well, same disclaimer is appropriate for the new tech times. We can't possibly review for you every video game and computer software program, let alone all the new consumer electronics equipment. All we can really do is show you a few examples, and give you occasional insights. You may want to follow up in your local library or elsewhere. Consumer Reports, other magazines do test and review products. Using them can save lots of time and money. I'm Nicholas Johnson. I'll be looking for you here next week on the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times has been brought to you through a grant from Warsaw Insurance Companies. Times change. Warsaw works. For discount information and your free copy of How to Buy a Home Computer, send $1 to The New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Thank <laughs> you.